Gameplay and story segregation is a trope commonly encountered in the gaming world. It's what happens when the mechanics of a game don't necessarily line up with what we know about the in-game lore. This trope is easiest to spot in video games, but it does exist in board games, role-playing games, and, yes, even in card games. In Magic the Gathering, there are countless examples of cards that go against what is possible or known in the lore. O Kagachi, for example, is extremely underwhelming as a card, despite being one of the most powerful beings in the story. These flavor fails are abundant in the game, sure, but there's also a great deal of the exact opposite. Flavor wins, or, in trope terms, gameplay and story integration. Sometimes, magic cards do a really good job of matching what they represent in the lore, and in my opinion, one of the most flavorful mechanics in the game is also the most flexible, that being the humble keyword known as indestructible. This evergreen ability, present since the beginning of the game, prevents damage and destruction effects from getting rid of whatever permanent it's attached to, making it one of the best defensive abilities your cards can have. And while I do greatly enjoy casting Sliver Hive Lord and making all my slivers indestructible, what I like even more is how this ability can represent so many different things in the lore. You see, there's a lot of different types of indestructible if we look at this ability from a lore perspective. Across the multiverse, there exists various ways for different things to prevent harm or damage, some greater than others. Sure, mechanically it's all the same, but flavor-wise, there's a big difference between the hardness of Darksteel and the celestial nature of the Theros gods. I believe it's possible to order indestructibility into four tiers, each representing a different kind of durability or method of ignoring damage. In Tier 4, we have what could be the weakest examples, Situational Indestructibility, the kind granted usually by intervention. In this tier, we have protection provided not by magic or durability, but through the act of avoiding danger or being protected by others. Dauntless Bodyguard, for example, is able to sacrifice itself to temporarily protect another creature. A knight jumping in the way of an attack to defend their charge is a noble sacrifice to be sure, but it doesn't really make that individual indestructible. After the sacrifice is made and the turn has passed, the creature the knight died protecting will have to resort to their own skills to defend themselves. Another type of indestructibility in this tier is the kind gained through indomitable tactics, Unbreakable formation shows a group of Azorius arresters working in perfect unison. Together they can repel any attack, and this card grants all of your creatures indestructible for a turn, even making them stronger if you timed it correctly. Finally, this tier can represent temporary magical invulnerability. Gideon Jorah, famously, was able to conjure up a magical shield that protected him from virtually all attacks. This shield could not be kept up indefinitely, and it couldn't protect him from everything, but it still made him effectively invulnerable when it was active. Tier 3 indestructible is the kind that represents extremely durable materials or creatures. Dark steel, for instance, is a metallic substance that is incredibly difficult to so much as scratch, and the gods of Amonkhet are large and in charge. However, with enough know-how or the right skill, things in this tier are just as vulnerable as any normal creature in the lore. Dark Steel, for instance, is certainly dense and nigh unbreakable, but it is possible to break it down and shape. Though the exact method is unknown, forging it is possible. The Amonkhet gods, meanwhile, are known to be vulnerable to the right attacks, a fact that, sadly, led to most meeting their end. Indestructible examples in Tier 2 represent beings that are, typically, magically immune to most forms of attacks. The Theros gods, for instance, are all but immune to any attempt mortals could make to injure them. 
Since they are composed of the very essence of Nyx, these gods are effectively a part of the world itself, but they are not completely invulnerable, merely very difficult to injure. It takes a lot of energy, but as seen with Xenagos, it is a possible. Still, killing something that has tier 2 indestructibility is easier said than done. The Myojin of Kamigawa could in theory be defeated, but their mastery of mana and sheer power make that outcome unlikely for all but the most godly of individuals. Finally, in Tier 1, we have the truly invulnerable, beings that are, effectively, unstoppable. This isn't to say they can't be killed, they can, but doing so would require extremely special circumstances. Avacyn, for instance, was an archangel created to defend the world of Innistrad in a time when planeswalkers could shape reality. Nothing could harm her, and she was able to completely ignore any kind of attack. Thanks to the spells and blessings woven into her being, Avacyn was completely unfazed by physical or magical assault. In her insane state, this angel went toe-to-toe -to -toe with her very creator, Soren Markov, who tossed her through pillars and down through the floor. None of this was able to dent her at all. The only way to defeat Avacyn, it seemed, was to undo the very spells that made her in the first place, revoking the blessings that were intertwined into her being. Had Soren not done this, it's possible that nothing on Innistrad could have stopped the Mad Angel. So, there you have it. The different tiers of Indestructible, all represented in one of Magic's most flavorful keywords. Do you agree with these tiers, or do you think I'm mistaken in how they should have been arranged? I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or share this video with your friends. If you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell, you'll be alerted whenever I upload new videos. Finally, I'd like to extend a thanks to my patrons Chelsea, Sirius Fang, Eric Jimenez, Knott, and Joshua Ward. If you like what I do and want to support me, consider becoming a patron. A link will be in the description below. Thanks again, and have a great day.